along the Mississippi River, six miles from present-day St. Louis, Missouri, there stood a city that once dominated the heart of the continent. At its center was a powerful leader. A great number of years ago, there appeared among us a man who came down from the sun. This man told us that he had seen from on high that we did not govern ourselves well, that we had no master, that each of us had presumption enough to think himself capable of governing others while he could not even conduct himself. A thousand years ago, the great son, a leader who was both king and pope, lived atop a man-made royal mountain ten stories high, its sixteen-acre base larger than any pyramid in Egypt. He told us that in order to live in peace among ourselves, we must observe the following points. We must never kill anyone but in defense of our own lives. We must never know any woman besides our own. We must never take any things that belong to another. We must never lie, nor get drunk. We must not be avaricious. We must give generously and with joy and share our subsistence with those who are in need of it. From the heights of his royal estate, the great sun mediated between the Creator and the people, between the sun and the earth. This is Cahokia, city of the sun. The great sun ruled the thriving center of a vast Mississippian culture. Outside the walled city, communities of farmers, hunters, and fishermen stretched for miles, surrounded by fields of corn. With 20,000 residents, no city in the United States would surpass Cahokia's historic size before 1800. Only then would Philadelphia's population eclipse the ancient center. These people lived in uh, daub and wattle houses on top. The, the principal people did, the priest and the royalty. They lived in, in very substantial houses, not teepees, not teepees, teepees, Western Plains people. Down here they lived in houses. They were sedentary, they were farmers, they used the rivers and the miles and the streams as uh, not only for commerce but for sustenance as well. With the Mississippi and other major rivers as its highways, Cahokia was linked by trade to a third of the continent. Copper arrived from the Great Lakes, obsidian from Yellowstone, mica and crystal from the Appalachians, gold and silver from Canada, shell from the Gulf of Mexico. these old live oak trees that have seen so much pass by them. Magnificently dressed Indian people coming down that bar in a dugout, uh, greeting people, standing right here on this bank of having a good time, because they did. You know, Indian people have always known how to have a good time. And there would be a feast prepared. And the women would put the corn together. They'd make softki. Um, they would roast a deer. The people would bring gifts. You never go to an Indian's house without bringing something that is as old as the sunrise. Cahokia was the pinnacle of a mound-building culture with traditions dating back to before 1000 BC. 
Thousands of mounds still dot the landscape from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. An average funeral mound in the Ohio Valley was three stories tall. Construction could represent 200,000 man-hours of labor, or 100 men carrying the baskets of earth for a year. But few mounds compare with the religious effigy located 50 miles east of Cincinnati, Ohio, the Great Serpent Mound. The enormous snake stretches over 400 yards in length. While their earthworks are the mound builders' most visible legacy, their smaller creations are their most beautiful. Only glimpses remain of the people who changed the course of life on the northern continent. Most of their material world, wooden buildings, boats, baskets, woven textiles, leather footwear and clothes, have long since turned to dust.